business. We have an awesome speaker tonight, S.C. Moadi. I've known S.C. for a while. Um, she's a fellow Stanford Business School alum, and we met at an awesome product event and hit it off. She's, her specialty is in mobile product management. Um, she's CEO and founder of Products Account. It's an awesome uh, meetup and group and organization in the city. Very, you know, a lot of similarities to what we do here. Great speakers up there. Um, she also ha was CEO and founder of a startup called Rendezvous that was acquired by Facebook. She worked at Facebook for a while in the mobile space. She's very savvy. Before that, she worked at Nokia. Um, so I like she basically a lot of her products that she's worked on. Like if you take all the people that use it's like billions of people have used the product that she's worked on. They were nominated for Emmys. Um, and most recently, the new exciting news is her book Mobilized is coming out uh, in like two weeks. I think May 2nd, right? May 2nd. And we're going to be giving away five copies, so that's very exciting. So, and again, her Twitter handle is at SC Moadi. So without further ado, let me, let's give a warm welcome to SC Moadi. Try again, try again, try again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody in the back, raise your hand if you hear me. If you're not deaf, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, so I'll try to stay here because I don't want to create any Larsen, and then I'll reach out when I need to change slide. All set. Okay, so it's very uh, exciting to be here tonight. Uh, thank you, Dan, for inviting me. Um, I've known Dan for a really long time. I also um, am very excited to be sharing, you know, some of the learnings uh, that you know, the past 12 years of working on mobile products have, um, have taught me. Uh, my goal for tonight is that you leave away with the feeling that, oh, this is so easy. Like, so if you leave away with that feeling, that's, that's how I know I've won. And if you remember that feeling when you're in front of your computer and you're like, you know, I can't figure this out, or when you're on your mobile, it's like, oh, I hate how this works right now, then you know, I I'll have done my job because that's what makes for uh, the best mobile products. They feel so... Uh, simple and easy, and we'll go through the rules that uh, make them so. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. Like As Dan mentioned, what you see in the background is a picture of our monthly events. Uh, we do them at Yelp headquarters in the city. The next one is next Wednesday, and we're hosting uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent Silicon Valley insiders, Tim Chang, a venture capitalist, to talk about messaging platform. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, come check it out. Uh, a little bit more about me, although I will be very brief on this uh, because Dan already uh, said so much about me. So um, all, all these years building products um, at Nokia, at Facebook, and other companies, almost every time the mission of the company is connecting people. Right? At, uh, at, um, at Nokia, the mission of the company, connecting people. At Facebook, connecting people. And then Nokia had a very kind of emotional way to go about it. You had a lot of, you know, in the advertisements, a lot of pictures of people <coughs> smiling at one another. And then Facebook has a very kind of analytical way to go about it. You see a lot of, you know, growth hacking and stuff like that. And, you know, I think that the best mobile products sort of bridge that emotional and rational side. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, today. Oops. Okay. So first thing I want to talk about is um, that mobile uh, has created a new gold rush. And hopefully all of you guys already know that, but a few facts, right? The first thing is that mobile represents 4% of global GDP according to the Boston Consulting Group. And in countries like South Korea, it's 11%. So it's a, it's a huge amount of the economy. And what's really unusual is that unlike most of the previous utilities, it's all about private wealth. So it's not about the big railroad enterprises or, you know, like bringing some, you know, development to the West or whatever it is. It's about like making money. It's about private wealth. So it's really created a new gold rush and every single company wants to and really should get a meaningful piece of it. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the transition that Facebook went through when, when we went uh, when we became mobile. By, by the way, uh, raise your hand if, if you have a smartphone. Raise your ha other hand. No, no, no. Keep your hand up. Raise your other hand if you have Facebook on your smartphone. 
Okay, all right. Oh, shake your hands. <laughs> um, good, good. Uh, so so that, that's really, you know, saying uh, a lot about what the mobile revolution is about. Uh, Facebook, when, when it first started to realize that most of its audience was transitioning to mobile, said, oh, no big deal. It's just a technical, you know, language. So it trained everybody. It took a one-week boot camp, very Facebook approach, like analytical, we're just going to get that done, boom, poof. And um, it trained all of its engineers to the new languages of mobile. And then the stock went from $40 to $20. <laughs> that didn't work. And <coughs> the company at the time, you know, you were seeing headlines saying, Facebook is going to die because it doesn't get mobile. And that was true. Facebook really didn't get mobile. But at the same time, inside the company, you had people, like I remember when I first started working there, I would go to your colleague and say, hey, hey, Dan, I'm looking for that piece of information. Like, do, do you mind, like, helping me get it? And I was expecting, like, yeah, I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks, right? No, Dan would be like, oh, yes, I'll get on it right away. Like, it probably will be ready in a couple of hours. But if you need me before, like, just let me know. Like, two hours was the, you know, the sort of sense of urgency inside the company. <coughs> if you think about why that is, um, it's because, you know, people's social relationships are so important that you, you, always, you immediately want to know when you've been tagged on a picture, or you want to know when somebody has a birthday, you want to know when something special, like you know, your best friend gets engaged or something like that. And so there's a sense of urgency in that company that's incredible. And if you think of you know, computers, which were the main interface that Facebook had at the time, you, know, you only could check Facebook when you had a computer in front of you. Like how many of you are checking Facebook right now? If you have a computer, very few people. But on your mobile, you probably don't want to say, but like a bunch of you are probably like looking at Facebook right now. Because Facebook was mobile before there was uh, mobile, really. So uh, one of the mission and the cultural value of the company was move fast and break things. And great, for the web, perfect. You break something, you hack your way into fixing it, you push it, it takes less than an hour or sometimes a few hours when it's really bad. It's a free service anyway, so who cares, right? But on mobile, it doesn't work like this, and you guys already know this, because to fix on mobile, you have to fix on every platform. You have to make sure that there's no regression, because you're going to ship software, so you cannot really like patch it or fix it like very easily. Then you have to submit it to the App Store. It takes a couple of weeks. And between the moment you notice the mistake and the moment the mistake is fixed, there's probably like at the minimum one month, and most likely two months that have passed. And when you have something that's broken for two months, People start hating you, they give you bad reviews, they delete your service. It just leaves a mark, you lose sales. It leaves a mark that you cannot remove. And that's a huge cultural shift. So Facebook changed its value from move fast and break things to just move fast, right? No more breaking things. <laughs> and now actually it's changed even more because of the transition to you know, more of a, a professional environment. It's like move fast and avoid regressions or something along these lines. <laughs> but we won't, we won't go there yet. So, so <clears throat> a lot of companies think that you know, this transition, and by the way, the stock went from $20 to now over $100. Right? That's the, the power of a mobile transition. And, and you know, a lot of companies, especially on the East Coast or, or in Europe, I travel there sometimes, uh, will say, well, yeah, but that's true for Facebook. Or maybe that's true for you guys like crazy out of Silicon Valley. Or maybe that's true for tech companies or web companies. Not true. It tr it's true for every single company that uh, you know, this mobile first transition is a cultural transition and not a technology transition. That's not me. Um, <clears throat> why, why is it true? It's true because um, this, is, this is how mobile is, is coming into our, into our life, right? Mobile is coming into our life because we all have a smartphone, right? You raised you know, your right hand or your, or your left hand, whichever one it was, but everybody has a smartphone. And so all the marketing departments at every company is looking at that and saying, hmm, if I want to be relevant in five years, no, actually, if I want to be relevant in one year, <laughs> I, better, I better focus on mobile. And the options that they have without a mobile product to do mobile marketing are very limited. They can do a little bit of advertising. It's expensive, like unclear return, display advertising, very cumbersome on mobile, you know, smartphone, watches, uh, glasses, anything very cumbersome. So they can do a little bit of that. They can do a little bit of geofencing, but nobody quite, you know, can quite figure it out yet. And so until and unless they have a mobile product, they cannot very well spend their marketing dollars. So they go back inside their organization and they say, hey, engineering team, product team, design team, we really need a mobile product in order to do effective mobile marketing. And that's when you know, 
the CTO and the CPO and the CDO are like, great, we're finally going to be building these cool mobile products. And so they put together a plan that's obviously super expensive because it's an app for iOS, an app for Android, something for tablets, something for watches, a responsive, right, a mobile friendly website, and so on and so forth. And so the CFO sees the bill and he's like, uh, I don't think so. And why? Because he remembers 10, 15 years ago uh, when people transitioned to the web uh, and they took a technology approach. So people came in like from IBM and Microsoft. I know there's someone from Microsoft here. Uh, and they said, well, you really need to transition to web technology and especially because your 2000 is coming and it's going to cost you a lot of money. And so everybody took their big catalog and they put their catalog onto their websites and these were very static, very text-heavy website. You couldn't really buy. You couldn't read reviews. You couldn't leave reviews. You couldn't see what other had purchased. There, has no, there was no business model. And these pages, I see somebody yawning. Like, OK. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm boring, please yawn, everybody. <laughs> OK. So, so they saw these, uh, you know, these static web pages. Today, they, they would make you laugh, right? You're like, oh, ha, ha, these guys didn't get it back then. But back then, they, they actually they made me cry. Um, so you know, the CFO thing back, and, they, and he thinks, like, when we did that transition to the web, it was, it was a nightmare, right? It was really a cost. It put a huge burden on my P&L, zero ROI, you know. And he says, no, I'm not going to spend the same amount of money on mobile. I'm not going to hire these you know, mobile product manager, these mobile engineers. They're way too well paid. I cannot afford this. And then the CEO is left with the CMO very unhappy, with the engineering uh, team very frustrated, and with the CFO like planting the food and saying no. And, and, and that's because the approach is the wrong approach to look at mobile as a technology as opposed to a change of culture. Now, you're going to ask me, like, well, what's the change of culture? Uh, and the change of culture is this, that you know, the truth is our mobile products, everybody brings them to work, right? Everybody has them with them. So from the janitor to the salesperson to the operations manager to the financial analyst, everybody has a mobile product. And the fact that we have, after the Industrial Revolution, built these huge organizations that are corporate with functional organizations and crazy entities that escalate and de-escalate and re-escalate and cross-functionalize themselves, has completely um, made us lose the perspective that we're, we're all humans, right? And so these mobile products that we bring with us, they're really extensions of ourselves. And even if today they look like very clunky extensions of ourselves, they, they are really extensions of ourselves, and they are with us always. And it's the first time in history that this happens. So people have still a hard time understanding what that means in terms of, in terms of that cultural change. So the, the culture is all about people, right? Like if we think about like how we create great mobile products, uh, as in how we create great extensions of ourselves, we look at like, well, what do we want to be when we are our best selves? So you all had a little card on your chair, like a yellow little card. Turn it, take a look at it. Yes. Turn it around. That, that's what you'll see on that card. This is your cheat sheet to remember how to build great mobile products. Because great mobile products are um, just like you know, images of our best selves. And so the, the, the most efficient way to describe what makes us our best self is the mind-body-spirit framework. And if I think about like, okay, mind, body, spirit, what do we want for ourselves? Well, we want to look good. I want to look good. Um, we want to have all the emotional stuff figured out. Why we, want, we want meaningful lives. And then we also want to keep learning and growing. Right? And so that's the, the body rule that the most successful mobile products are beautiful. Then that's the spirit rule that the most successful mobile products give us meaning. And then the mind rule, which is that the most successful mobile products keep learning as we use them. So that's what we're going to be talking about for a little while. Any question? Yeah? Is it, is it easy? Is it simple? Like, does it feel like it's, like it's too easy? Who feels it's too easy? Nobody? Oh, better do a better job. OK. Uh, OK, so let's start with the, the body rule then. The body rule goes like this, right? We're, we're sitting at a restaurant, and then somebody really good looking walks in. And what's happened? What happens is everybody looks at them, right? It doesn't matter like 
men, women, old, young, tall, short, color of the skin, doesn't matter. Like everybody is like kind of wowed by, um, by a beautiful person, right? And, um, and then if I ask some of you to describe what makes a beautiful person, anybody wants to take a stab at it? I, I like two people, so please. Yes? Symmetry. symmetry. Does everybody think symmetry is beauty? Anybody disagree with that? Yes, you disagree. Okay, all right, so doesn't really apply. Another criteria? Health. Health? Okay, a anybody thinks an unhealthy person? <laughs> no? What about, like about artists, like drug, you know, and Rolling Stones and good looking, yeah? What about presence? Presence, okay. So we, we can play that game. The truth is that almost every single time you'll be able to find like one thing is true and another is the opposite because defining beauty is something that we humans have been trying to do for a few thousands of years and we're still like struggling to do it. Uh, there's a lot of um, scientists like mathematicians that have tried to define beauty. Pythagoras in ancient Greek he said, you know, beauty is a set of formula. There's actually a formula that is the golden mean, and then there's a formula that defines what makes for beautiful music. And then there's Birkhoff in the 20th century. He said that beauty equals like O over C, that's order out of chaos. So beauty is creating order out of chaos for the kind of the rational part of uh, these people who have tried to define beauty. And then there's another camp, which is uh, like uh, the artists, like Leo Tolstoy, the Russian writer, and a bunch of, the, of these people who say, well, defining beauty is actually impossible. It is not rational. It is in the eyes of the beholder, right? So if I think something's beautiful, then it's beautiful. And nobody can argue with that because it's about, you know, the emotions and the feeling that beauty triggers. So same thing with mobile. There's a very rational definition of beauty, which is efficiency, where nothing is wasted, and then there's a very emotional definition of beauty, which is that it has this wow factor. It's like totally skipping our consciousness. So the skipping of our consciousness, right? Like if you remember or if you watch some of the video of Steve Jobs launching the first iPhone, like he pulls it out of his pocket. He's rehearsed that move for like hours and hours. And everybody's like all of a sudden like standing ovation. Some people are crying and it's like really out of this world, right? Like clapping and everything. It's really, I mean, and, and people mean it, right? It's a very emotional reaction. And, <clears throat> and then the, the rational part, if you look at, you know, some products that are so simple to use, like I'll, I'll, I'll use Pandora as an example, right? Pandora, like billions of musical uh, of songs, right? Hundreds of criteria uh, in the music genome, which is the, the, the set of rules that they use to classify musical taste. And then one very simple room, like sum up, sum down. I like it, I don't like it. And it's able to recommend you know, music and, and songs that we like. 80% of people use Pandora because it is just so simple, right? Nothing is wasted. So these are some, some examples of what is so beautiful and so simple about mobile, that very rational and that very emotional side. Now, how do you apply it to your own product? So your own product, <clears throat> There, there are two, two tests that I use. The, the first one, the rational one, is, is the thumb test. The thumb test says that if I'm able to do something with my thumb or with a regular thumb without getting distracted, then I, I pass the thumb test. And that's the, the rational side, that efficiency side of beautiful mobile products. Why is it so important? Because, again, we talked about the importance of context in mobile. If, if, I, if, I, if I'm on my mobile and then all of a sudden I'm distracted by the context, I, you've lost me, right, as, as a, as a um, product manager. So, so that thumb that keeps me focused, that, that's really what's, really what's critical to have that rational efficiency side. And we're going to talk about like, some design elements that help focus and pass through the sum rule successfully. And then <clears throat> the emotional side, I, I, um, anybody ever describe what they do to their mother and she understands? Well, yes. So, uh, yes. And and how does she look when she understands? She loves it. She's like, oh my god! I know what she's doing now. I finally get it, right? And that's the mom test. So, if you have something that you're working on, like a mobile product, and people get it that way, the way your mom gets it, then you pass that emotional, like visceral reaction. And and the way that I describe. Um, this is, is through uh, expanding design element because all of a sudden there's this like, oh yeah, I totally get it, right? 
all of a sudden it's personalized. So we're developers. Like usually, like after I share all that stuff, like the you know the non-technical audiences that I talked about, like okay, yeah, I totally get it now how to build great products. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, you're just scratching the surface. So now let's go a, a little bit deeper and look at uh, five focusing design elements and two expanding design elements. So focus and then expand, right? So focus, I'm going to follow like a, a, the simple progression of what happens with a user who's getting his, his or her first experience with your mobile product. First thing that you do, remember, like they're constantly distracted by the context around them. So you need to onboard them, right? That's like, oops, lure them in. And that onboarding element, I was working with a company a few months ago, their onboarding flow, right, had 17 step. <laughs> yeah. We brought it down to five step. I still think it's too many, right? Because on mobile, like remember, again, you're like on your phone or on your watch or on your iPad, you raise your head, you look around, you're gone, right? So these onboarding elements, they're really critical because you need to make sure that you capture the attention. And you do that in like a few seconds. And they start from the moment that you are, you know, on a mobile website or in the app store. They don't start from the point of the product. They start before that. Like how do you get people to all of a sudden focus? Once you get them to focus, you have to meet their expectations. So the first thing that you want them to do when they signed up, well, like once they're onboarded, right, and um, it is, is a single task. Like what is the one thing that you want people to do to make sure that they will have a positive experience with you? I can tell you, for example, Pandora, we talked about it, 80% of the user base on mobile. What they're really trying to get you to do is create your own station. Why? Because they know that if you do that, you're more likely to come back and to be captured by the magic of Pandora. With Facebook, I can tell you when you join, like what we try to get people to do is get 20 friends. Because we know that if you don't get 20 friends, you're less likely to come back. So you won't even have to create a profile, you won't have to, you know, you won't see the news feed, nothing like that. You'll just be like, invite friends to join, right? In invite friends to become your friends. Um, so that's single task, right? And remember the thumb rule. But then, you know, that's not the only thing you're doing, right? You have like to enable people to do multiple things in your product. And so you want to go to navigation. Navigation on mobile is something that you, you want to avoid, right? You go basically from single task to single task <laughs> to single task. And so your navigation, most of the time, you want to make sure that it's a very simple, single navigation. There are a few exceptions. Like there's a, a service like Airbnb, for example. They have two sets of navigations, very confusing. We had that for a moment at Facebook. You had, you had like a horizontal navigation, a vertical navigation. It was confusing everybody, right? So what are in the navigation, what are the set of you know, three to five tasks that are so important that you really want to feature them prominently in your navigation? So you're still following right, the progression of these users, right? They're onboarded, they're captured, you've showed them value immediately. Then they do one thing and they succeed and they, they do something that's of value to them. And then you can get them to do one more thing or maybe a few more things. And then the app crashes. <laughs> yeah, that happens because if you get people to do too many things, then you know you get a lot of these crashes. We had that problem over and over on Facebook, especially you know when you work at larger organization organizations. What happens is that you'll have all these product teams that want to go mobile, and they're competing to feed a lot more stuff on their mobile services, and then it really affects performance because you know, our mobile devices today are still very, very clunky, right? So they're unreliable, they crash. That's where you get the worst reviews, right? If you have poor navigation, you get really bad reviews. If you have poor performance, I feel Dan has a really interesting pyramid, right? The, is it the Olsen pyramid? The higher the The O-L-S-E-N, <laughs> Olsen pyramid, where he says, you know, like most people who, they, who, who become product manager at the, at the beginning, they focus at the top of the pyramid like beautiful little you know, graphic design and stuff like that. And he says, when I come into work with a customer, I focus at the bottom of the pyramid on, on performance and scalability. So on mobile, like, this is really important. And especially it's important for the stuff that we talked about earlier, which is you know, very lengthy approval processes. And then the final step is um, in, in your you know, focusing design elements is gestures. So the use of gestures, I put it last because this is sort of the, the wild card on mobile. Some people think that if they invent a new gesture, they're going to become like Tinder or like Instagram, right? Double tap or swap right, right, left. And most of the time, like, 
it doesn't work that way. Like either it's very hard to discover the gesture or it's a gesture that's been used for some other purpose and it confused the hell out of users or it's a gesture that's really hard to reproduce. Like at Nokia, we tried to do this thing where you, you hold and scale and it was just like very cumbersome. So my recommendation for most cases is use very simple, very standard gestures. So these are the focusing design elements. And then what you can do is you can run your product through these five and they're exhaustive, right? Like they help your user focus. So, so you can identify like, okay, what's gonna be helping my users focus on the one thing that I need to do to create some, something very, very efficient? Do I have a very effective onboarding flow? Do I have a single task that I get my users to do when they first you know, start interacting with my service? And do I help them navigate very easily from one task to another? Am I crashing a little too often? Right? The impact, just to give you some, some data points, the impact of an increase uh, from like 75 per, to, to maybe 80 or 90% in, in performance is, is that you can 10x your uh, revenue conversion. That's how much crashes and bad performance affect your, your service. And then do I have gestures that are, that are standard? So you can run, run your service through, through these uh, focusing design elements. And then expanding design elements, they do the opposite, right? So you have all your context out there and you use the focusing design element to be efficient and focus you. And then you have that emotional reaction, which is like, how am I gonna wow my, my users? Well, I actually, I bring the context to them. And so I ask for pull permissions, like permission to pull like, contacts, permission to pull health information, permission to pull location, and all these different uh, sensors that you get. So I, I, I will use that context and bring it to create value for my users to expand their, their world, and then push permission, which is really push notifications, where it's like, okay, my, my users don't even need to use my product anymore. I just let them know when there's something of notice to them. Um, <clears throat> one question I get often with, the, with these expanding elements is when is the right time, right? Again, context, when is the right time to ask for permissions? And uh, there's sort of two, two schools, right? Like sometimes your service cannot function without permissions, like for example, WhatsApp, the messaging service, cannot really function without push notifications. And so it's important that as quickly as possible, even maybe sometimes at the onboarding stage, you ask for these permissions. But then, you know, if you wanna post a picture, like, Unless you're on Instagram where posting pictures is really critical, like accessing the camera, you want to do that as late as possible in the context so that from a user perspective, it feels like it's just a single task and there's no interruption. Like, why am I asked to like, you know, give access to my camera? Like, if you, if you, if you get that kind of questions or reaction from your users, you, you've lost them. You've lost them to the context around them. Any, any question on this? Okay, so now the next rule is the, the spirit rule. So the spirit rule is all about relationships. So remember the time when you met your significant other, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, you're in love. <laughs> you wanna spend all your time with this person. And why you wanna do that is because they, they understand you, right? Like they meet all your needs. It's completely like intimate, it's very personalized. Um, and, and you spend all of your time in this, in this sort of bubble, right? And, and it gives you meaning, like love is the, the ultimate form of meaning. And, and then, you know, there's a time when you start to introduce these people to <clears throat> your communities, your parents, your friends, your colleagues, and then things can go, you know, bad or, or, or well, it sort of depends. And you have a bit of a love-hate relationship now with your partner. Um, <clears throat> that seems like it sounds familiar. Well, it's exactly the same with our, with our mobile products, right? Like we, we want them to be completely personalized, but yet, you know, when there's sort of, uh, you know, social environments, we, we don't have really good social norms for how to interact with our mobile products when, when we're in communities. So um, take the, the example of my GPS. <clears throat> I have a love-hate relationship with my GPS because it finds me wherever I am, right? And I cannot go, go places without it. But then, you know, I'm thinking like maybe somebody else has access to my GPS or knows where I am and I don't really like that. And it's the same thing with Tinder, for example, the dating service, like it's very, very personalized. It shows me people who are really close to me, like who are in, in my vicinity, who are available, who I, I have friends in common with. And then, you know, maybe there's some privacy breach and I don't really want to, you know, people to know that I was on Tinder and things like that. 
Um, so, so how do you um, how do you apply the the spirit rule? Like you you have internal right personalization and external filters from the environment that that you use, and um, these filters they come in a few forms. So again, like this is really like a checklist for you to go through and think like, okay, how do I use uh, these filters on my you know, mobile service? Or when I build my mobile service, how do I use these filters? So the inter internal filter, which personalize everything, they come in two forms, right? They are people filter and places filter. And uh, people filter, it's like all your social cards, uh, your contact book, your uh, stuff that relates to your calendar. And then places filters, it's your GPS, it's uh, information that you know will help will help people like uh, um, get you places or, or show you where we are, where you are, and then external filters. Uh, there are three forms of filters. So external filters, you use them when you go into communities, right? When it's not just you and the personalization you get from your mobile service, but you, your device and the environment around you. So you have uh, policy, popularity, and permission. Policy is like the privacy policy, right? Like there's rules that you can, you need to follow, and rules that you need your users to follow, um, to make sure that you respect their privacy. Um, popularity it's like reviews and ratings, very important on mobile because it allows you to make better connections uh, with the world around you. And then permission, uh, which is uh, you know all these. Um, 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 abuse report and stuff like that. I'll give you an example um, of, of uh, permission. When uh, when I worked at Facebook, we um, we had um, a, a problem because people who were reporting abuse, like most of them, like about eighty percent of them, were uh, were um, stopping halfway through. It's like okay, so you see a picture that you don't like and you want to report it, and then halfway through that you stop. Why, why do people stop? Um, and the truth is like people stop because most of the time their friend posted a picture of them not looking good and they were like, oh, how could they do this, right? Like I don't look good on that picture and then they start reporting it because they hate them and, and themselves in that picture and then they stop halfway, they think, oh, but wait, wait, what's, what's Mandy going to think? There, she's going to think that you know, I, I think I'm, I, she's a poor photographer, or maybe I don't like her anymore, or maybe we used to be friends, but we're no longer. Or, you know. And then all of a sudden, like reporting that picture becomes questioning the friendship. And so they stop halfway because they're like, no, 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 no. I'd rather suffer from that poor picture than lose my friendship with Mandy. So, so what we did is we changed that to say, hey, not like that picture is like, you know, not well framed or blurry or something, but rather that picture is making me feel, uh, you know, sad or making me feel uh, ashamed or something like a, a lot more about like how people may feel about the picture rather than how um, the picture is like. And so the judgment is no longer like I'm judging that your picture is really bad and therefore I'm sort of judging that you're a bad person. Now it becomes about like my feelings are being hurt, and I'd like you to understand that. And all of a sudden, that abuse report that was, you know, uh, a lot more like about meaning and about, um, you know, what, what's dear to your spirit became completed at like 98%, right? So people who saw a picture that offended them were actually able to go through with that permission. Question. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what you mean by like a filter? The filter is, the, is you as a product maker or product manager or designer giving people some ways to filter uh, the information that you want them to use in making your experience more personalized. Oh, okay. So you, you have your user in command, mm -hmm. but you're giving them the, the, um, uh, the key to where you want them to control. Oh, okay. Okay. And then there was another question. Okay. All right, so the third rule, the mind rule. The mind rule is all about learning, right? So learning, there's lots of ways that we learn. There was somebody earlier who was in education. Where are you? It, oh, yeah, that's you, sorry. Um, so, so, you know, you have sort of people learn like uh, right brain and, and left brain. And, and it's the same thing with, with mobile. So there's a scientific way 
that we learn. It's very incremental. It's like effort driven. And most of the time, it's like we set a goal for ourselves. We put everything towards that goal, and it looks like a funnel. And then we optimize, <coughs> optimize, optimize, right? So very, very incremental. And then there's a more artistic way that we learn. And it's a lot more of a disruptive way. Like we sort of reinvent ourselves, right? And so if you practice any hobby, like your teacher will tell you, like practice makes perfect. That's the incremental way. And then all of a sudden, you'll have a breakthrough <laughs> in your hobby, and you'll become whatever, a great martial artist or, or a great cook. But there is that breakthrough moment where all of a sudden, you become a different person, right? You become from a, from a novice, you become a, a, a martial artist, or from a you know, kind of a, an eater, you become uh, a cook. Uh, on, on mobile, it's the same thing, right? So these very scientific technique, tactics, like a lot of people, like Sean Ellis uh, talked about it uh, last month, uh, a lot of people use growth hacking to, to practice and, and, and better their scientific practices. Uh, in the Valley, I think we, we underestimate the uh, artistic side of, um, of learning, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, let, let me use uh, one example, which is the example of WhatsApp. So WhatsApp, the scientific way that WhatsApp is learning, great example is, you know, uh, who uses WhatsApp here or who has used WhatsApp? Okay, so most people are familiar with it. Okay, so when you send a message on WhatsApp, it will show you like two little check marks when that message gets delivered, right? And then these check marks will turn a different color when the message has been read. Now, why did the WhatsApp team decide that this is what they wanted to display to the user? Scientific method, right? Fix a goal like optimize engagement, test a bunch of different things, see what works, do more of it, right? So goal, funnel, optimization. Now, the thing that's disruptive about WhatsApp is it looks really simple, right? It's very obvious, sort of like, you know, what I'm trying to communicate with this service, with, with this talk, that things are very simple. WhatsApp is a simple way to connect people, right? To, uh, enable communication, free, seamless. But there was another thing like that called SMS, right? So SMS, however, was expensive, uh, not for us in the US, but in a lot of countries where WhatsApp initially took off. It cost a lot because people had limited data plans. And then it was also very unreliable. Again, like for, for a US audience, less so. But in a lot of countries, like going from one carrier to another, it was very difficult. So that's what WhatsApp all of a sudden so then it completely disrupts one more time the way that people communicate with one another. So these, um, the tools that, that um, I suggest um, for, for learning, there are a few, like the, the, rash, the scientific way, the, the rational one, I, I look at uh, the Net Promoter Score. Uh, I think the Net Promoter Score is an awesome tool to, to look at on mobile. Again, because mobile users are so easily distracted by their context. It's very hard for them to learn. They keep like raising their head up, and, and then there they are. They're, they've lost context. And so when you use your net promoter score as a way to test how people are you know, using your service, learning, and improving, you focus on impact as opposed to focusing on, on effort or whatever it is that, that you can do. And then um, the artistic tool, tools that I recommend, there are three of them, uh, and, and I describe them um, in, in detail in, uh, in my book. The first one I will call a hook, then uh, the second one is a, a shortcut, and then the third one is, is a layer. So a hook is, um, if you think of a hook, uh, you think of uh, like the Zillow's estimate, right? So who, who wants to know what their house is worth? That's it? Who wants to know the house they live in is worth? The house their neighbor lives in. <laughs> the house their boss lives in. <laughs> Bastards. Hmm? OK, so, 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 so all of a sudden, like, uh, but, but then who, who wants to sell or buy a house in the next two years? Very few people. So, but all of a sudden, like, you have Zillow, a new, new company trying to gain visibility. They hook you, like, hey, do you want to know how much that house is worth? So that's, you know, if you think about that goal and that funnel, that all of a sudden creates a funnel that expands like that, like a hook all over. Um, an audience that wouldn't necessarily um, be interested in, in your service. Same thing with um, you know, the, the Facebook poke. So the Facebook poke works a little bit differently. It's not so much that I want to poke you, it's that I really want to poke you back right, after you've poked me. Right? So it's kind of that you know, uh, way to like, hook an audience that wouldn't necessarily 
uh, come to you. And it's, you know, it's really random, it's really artistic and creative. Um, the second element is an element that instead of like widening your funnel, it's going to shorten it, right? It's a shortcut. So one thing we tried at, at Trulia, very effective, is um, we, we, we knew that people wanted to look for, like we, we were looking at helping people find a place to rent. And help, helping people find a place to rent, like nobody wants to look for a place to rent. It's so boring. It's not a place to, to buy, which is like, you know, dream uh, emotional. It's a place to rent so you can save for the down payment for the next time you're going to actually have fun buying your own house, right? So renting is not a very fun process. And um, people have very, very set criteria for the way that they want to rent houses. So we, we, we knew from the very beginning that if they were going to apply for a, you know, a two-bedroom house with a garage in Palo Alto, that's the type of stuff that they wanted. And so we started to recommend places like this to them. And then we took it one step further, and instead of just recommending two-bedroom with a garage in Palo Alto, we started applying on their behalf. Well, that's a little bit daring, right? It's like, ooh, like, what are you doing for me? In fact, like, our net promoter score went up <laughs> because people didn't care that we did it for them. We actually made their life a lot easier, and we were creating, like, shortcuts, right, to reduce the steps that it takes for them to complete an action. Another example of that is the, you know, when you buy something on Amazon, people who bought this also bought, or other books you may like, things like that. Create shortcuts, right? It really shortens your funnel. It helps you... Uh, be a lot more uh, efficient, and it's, and it's again, like quite creative. Uh, and then the third element that, that can really disrupt uh, the, the way that you, you grow and, and learn is adding a layer. So, so the most uh, known layer on mobile is push notifications. It's like a whole new way, right, like a whole new layer to your funnel that will allow you to reach people. Uh, another way, another example of a layer is um, if you think of Airbnb in the early days. Airbnb was going to Craigslist, was completely stealing all of their supply, right, place like vacation rental, and was adding a whole new layer of inventory. Now, it's, it's illegal to do that. They don't do it anymore. But that's how you can think of, like, how am I going to add a whole new layer to my funnel? And, and you know, thinking about it uh, with this framework in mind is a, is a good way for you to think, like, okay, I have the mechanics, I have the scientific part of my learning, the goal, the framework. Now let me add like the artistic side of it, which is going to widen the funnel, shorten the funnel, and then add a whole new layer uh, to the funnel. Question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned net promoter score. Can you uh, briefly explain that? To me? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, the net promoter score is a very interesting metric because it will ask one single question to your users after they've completed um, a task. It will say, how likely are you to recommend you know, your, this service to someone else. Okay. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't care about features or functions. <coughs> All it cares about is do you like it enough that you will recommend it to somebody? And then if you, on a scale of 1 to 10, and then if you give a score of uh, 9 or 10, or 8, 9 or 10, you're a promoter. So you, you count like positive. And if you're like 1 to 6, you're a detractor. And the net promoter score subtract the promoters, sorry, subtract the detractors from the promoters. That's why it's called the net promoter score. And that's, that's the score that you get. So for example, at you know, the, the event we, we run, Products That Can, we just started tracking that, our net promoter score. And the net promoter score uh, ranges from, you know, from 100 to minus 100. And uh, at, at Products That Count, our net promoter score is very high. It's about 70%, right? S sorry, 70. So it means that there's seven, for, for, for every person who's not happy, there are 70 who are happy. Okay, so um, I'll take questions. Like, I, I want to say this book is the, you know, I'm very excited to bring it to, uh, to every one of you um, because it's the product of, uh, you know, over 12 years of, of work and research, not just my own um, uh, work experience, but also dozens of interviews with people at Uber, at Pandora, at Slack, uh, at a bunch of other companies. So um, I, I really would love to have your feedback. If you want to give me feedback, you can uh, use the URL that's on the little card I gave you, scmoati.com, and you can either grab time with me. There's like a way that you can grab 15 minutes with me to chat after you read my book, or you can send me an email.
Great, I see you all. Thanks for an awesome talk. We'll go into Q&A. We like to use the mic so it can get picked up on the video. So we have one mic on each side. Just raise your hand if you want to get a question, and we'll, we'll give you the mic. Who's got a There you go. Oh, who's got a question? Anybody? Question. Do, do, do. Right in the back. Right, right here. Here you go, John. So you talked about uh, how improving the app stability. Um, I think it was the numbers were like 75% to 80% or 90%. Um, might lead to 10x in revenue. Can you talk about that again? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll, the example that uh, I'm referring to, that's a great question. Uh, the example that I'm referring to is the number one shopping app in Brazil that had a crush rate of 24%, right? So a success rate, like a performance uh, of 75%, and a conversion in terms of sales of uh, 1%. And uh, they brought their performance all the way up to 90%, so an increase in 15%. And their conversion rate in terms of sales went from 1% to 12%. So uh, unbelievable, right, how uh, performance improvement ha had an effect on conversion. And they had, like, you know, control tests and stuff, so it was really clearly performance-based. So a related question to that, so how could you... Uh, connect the 1% conversion rate in, and increase that to 12% and just assume that's related to app stability and not uh, Because of a uh, control group, like uh, A-B testing. So are you familiar with A-B testing methodology? Right. So you select a group of people, you test you know, your new service with, and then you select a group of people that you, know, uh, you, you don't, uh, don't use the new service and you just compare and contrast. Yes. Hi, um, interested to hear your thoughts around how th there's a lot of people talking about that there's a overload of having to download apps all the time and people's phones are getting way too cluttered. Everybody feels like they need to create their own app to own some part of the experience. Um, and s some of the movements of people trying to go towards either a more messenger focused or a bot focused way of communication or sort of streaming native versions of applications. Um, interested to hear your thoughts on how you see this space evolving and what that means for people who um, are very focused on the mobile app experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So uh, y you can think about it uh, as you know some of the last tools that I described. Like, where do you find new channels, right? And typically, like if you look at a funnel, like things get very crowded. Like as as innovation gets more mature things get very crowded. So if you set a goal for yourself and you have you know, a funnel like, I want to grow, I want to achieve this, I want to make sure I reach my, my you know, consumers on, on mobile, <coughs> like initially the, the mobile is like blue waters, right? Nobody has a mobile app. And so the first few people to put out a mobile app, everybody like tries it out, right? That's how you create like an Instagram type of you know, wonder. Uh, and then now, like, the, the app stores are, are extremely crowded and they're kind of a bit of a bottleneck, right? Because uh, they constrain uh, all app developers to go through one single fire hose in order to get attention, right? So it, it becomes a very crowded channel. The, the conversion funnel is, is, you know, is a money game uh, and it's no longer interesting. But the, the fact remains that you still need to get the attention of your users on mobile, right? So people are turning to new channels. So messaging is, is a new way to reach people on mobile, right? So all of a sudden, instead of having an app store that's a limited size of a fire hose, even though it offers like multiple categories or breaks it down by region or whatever it is, right? All of a sudden you have inside of an app store a messaging service that says, look, I'm gonna give you access to all your customers, but instead of going through the app store, you're just going to go through me. So it's a whole new fire hose, right? It's a whole new blue ocean. And that's what, you know, WhatsApp and WeChat and all these companies are doing. It's basically adding a new layer to your funnel, to, you know, which, which goal is how am I going to get the attention of my users on mobile? Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I do. In fact, I think that you know, the App Store was, was a very reasonable value proposition a few years ago when it wasn't as crowded. 
Now it's primarily a way you know, to, to, for agencies to make a lot of money. Uh, so messaging is one other way that uh, people are going to be able to get attention of their users on mobile. I think that you know, another thing that I would look at is deep linking. Because deep linking, instead of like messaging, really they create another fire, uh, another you know kind of limited set of uh, it, it's a kind of another app store. Instead of being like browsing for apps, you browse for channels. I mean, it's not very different, right? But if you look at deep linking, what it does is actually a little smarter because it says, well, if you are in a, you know if you are in Open Table and you just booked a restaurant, why don't you order an Uber to get you to the restaurant? And while you're at it, why don't you listen to Pandora while you're in your Uber, right? So it's kind of you know, bringing context back into the experience and not being constrained by like, the limit of you know, there are only so many apps in the App Store or in the top 10 of the App Store or you know, in the major like, public channels of, of Slack or whatever. So I would look at deep linking as a way to sort of disrupt a little bit that you know, kind of one single entry port. Does that make sense? Hi, yes. um, I had a question. Sorry. Ah, here you are. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I had a question that was kind of related to, to this one as well. Uh, especially we've seen like in the latest years uh, a trend where there was a, like a Facebook that was a very bloated app. Uh, and basically everybody, I mean, all the features were actually crammed into the mobile. And then they tried to actually separate. And now they have, I don't know, like uh, up to 10 apps or something like that to, mm -hmm. for all the different services. And some that are really specific. And so I was wondering, what do you think about that, basically? Yeah. Like, what's yeah. the actual, you know, the good way of doing things? Because is it really truly like single purpose? Uh, or is it kind of a platform, a bit more like a, even like messaging apps are becoming? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So single app versus multi-app strategy. So um, for, for small companies, I would say like, don't even, don't even think about it, right? Like it's a single app strategy and you don't want to play the game. Because you know, like basically there's kind of a first threshold which is how do you get attention, right? And get attention is like single app strategy, right? And once you got attention, you start to have a lot of different use cases and then you, that's when you start to have the performance problems. So the reason uh, you know, th there are two reasons that I think are valid reasons to have multiple apps. One is you have performance problem, which is the case of Facebook. And two is um, you, you are a public company and you need to keep pushing your DAU. And so what you do is instead of trying to get more users in your existing app, you just split it in two apps and you say, oh, look, we're growing, you know, and, and you sort of add one, one growth on top of another. So it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, my sense is that a multi-app strategy is not an ideal strategy um, because it's either for technical limitations or for sort of kind of fake, you know, shareholder expectations. Oh, yes, yes. So following up, following up on the previous question, we have all these apps that are dying to get our attention, right? Like constantly, and you have push notifications that are making things even worse. So as, or better. <laughs> so as this grows, eventually, I mean, these are going to be overwhelming, or probably are already are for many people. Do you see like these proxy apps or meta apps to start develop that kind of bring all these things together? Like if you think about news, you, you, you get to read news everywhere, but you have these proxies that bring you the correct type of content that you want. Do you see that thing coming in apps as well? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that's a really good and I think really hard question to answer. Um, and by the way, like one of the things that I did at Facebook was uh, manage the push notification channels. And uh, so, uh, so I understand you know, like what too much and too little means. And most of the time, like uh, as product managers, we think we're sending way too much and we're sending way too little. <laughs> Um, so, so people who are interested in your service, they, they want to hear from you. Um, so, so my answer to that is there's, again, like kind of a scientific and a, and a more artistic way to look at it. If you think of news, right, like there's a ton of news apps that are coming out or news services that are coming out. And, and some of them will use a lot of technology and algorithmic to kind of compute the best stuff for you. And then some will say, hey, we have a team of super smart curators, and they will pick the right stuff for you. The truth is, if you look at the result, it's the same stuff. 
Um, except, you know, when you go into like super local news, when you start following like a hyper, you know, uh, very expert people. And, and then it's a, a lot more of a social answer, which is maybe in the middle, like in between uh, an algorithmic approach and, and a very, you know, highly curated approach. So uh, I'm using this example of news because I think that with, with apps and with mobile use cases or notifications or ways that basically, you know, you are distracted away from your context into, you know, your mobile device. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a lot of um, different approaches. Some are going to be very scientific and algorithmic, looking at artificial intelligence and all the stuff that we see right now. Some are going to be highly curated. Like if you think of, um, you know, um, um, like the Skim is a service that I, that I use at, at the moment for news. It's, it's highly curated. It's like, what are the top three news you need to know? Uh, it's it's uh, they just released a, an app that that's pretty interesting. So so there's going to be a lot of kind of like either super scientific and algorithmic or super curated and like you know top of the line, and then the answer is going to be more like well you're going to find the long tail of it, and there's going to be um, a way that the long tail is going to emerge, which is going to be a mix of you know algorithmic like I'm I'm going to recommend because of my system that you follow this person, and then that person is going to curate some very specific hobbies. So that, that's my hunch. I, I don't think I have the, you know, the, the ultimate answer, but that's, that's where I think it's going to go. That's where I think it's going to go. Hi. Um, what's the best uh, approach for um, mobile app validation? Uh, mobile idea, uh, app idea validation? Is th I see there's different school of thoughts. What would uh, you prefer? I would suggest uh, the user testing guys. Um, I, uh, frankly, I mean, I've, I've used them a lot. Like, it, it really depends. I mean, there's a whole methodology for, for testing. So if you're at the very, very beginning, you know, you, you can look at the lean startup methodology, right? You look at uh, customer validation. Like, is, are people going to be interested in your offering? Are they going to be willing to pay for your offering? Or who is going to be willing to pay for the service you provide? And then you start, you know, prototyping. So uh, you can use some of the tools that, you know, the, the sponsors presented. Um, and, and then validate. Um, if your question is like, do you want to look at a very like methodical, like numbers driven approach versus uh, more of a, uh, you know, art artistic or emotional approach, you, you want to do both. Definitely want to do both. Does that answer your question? Right. And, and you want to do that before, before you build on, on mobile uh, native. So in other words, like do a lot of prototyping because developing on mobile is very expensive, right? So do a lot of prototyping. Then if you can uh, stick with mobile web, like stick with mobile web for a while. And then only when you sort of know what you're building, uh, go into native. Unless you're working in games, right. a little different. But sorry. You Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, I'm building a mobile app, and I'm I want to ask your opinion about the onboarding process. Um, right now, the or maybe for the past year, you know, using Facebook login as a very quick and easy access point to getting not only a user in but getting you know like information and things like that is very efficient. But in my testing and kind of you know asking people in general, there's a lot of aversion to it growing. Oh, yeah. um, yeah, there's just, aversion to what to using Facebook login. Yes, exactly. Hmm, um, why? Simply because of the fear that Facebook is somehow, even though it's a one-way pass, people don't understand that it's you know getting information from them. Um, I'm wondering what your opinions are about innovative onboarding processes other than that, and just your mm. yeah, insights. I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I would say stick with Facebook. I don't, you know, I know there's. I, you know, I, ha I had a service that was um, using Facebook login at, at a very, very early, um, early time when very few people were using it, and, and I had the exact same, you know, objection. But then, you know, if people are interested in your service, they'll just click the button and be like, "Oh, I need to." You know, I'm worried about my privacy, but you know, that's the thing to say. Okay. Hello. Um, so this question is related to the previous question, where you are still at the very early stage. Um, 
do we have to pay attention to the, all the three part of the formula or is there any specific one that you need to focus when you're right. still working on the MVP? Right. So, you know, I'll, I'll ask this, like if you want to be a great person, like I, I see, you know, most people who are at the top of their games, they, they pay attention to their body, like they exercise very frequently. Uh, they are great at building relationships with people and then they're curious and they keep learning. Um, I rarely see, I mean, sometimes I see people who are, you know, like very unhealthy, like we talked about it a bit earlier, right? Like, you know, drug addicts or, or musicians or, you know, crazy people on stage and, you know, uh, being, you know, like kind of uh, giving away one part of, of who they are, their mind, body, spirit. But, but that, you know, in my mind is relatively rare. A ver a very much the same with mobile. Like, look, look at the most successful mobile product and try to take away one of the pieces, right? Like, do you know of a great mobile product that is not beautiful? Like, I, personally, I, I don't, right? Do you know of a great mobile product that's not personalized? I, I don't, you know. Um, do you know, uh, they could be more personalized, but they're all personalized. And do you know of a great mobile product that doesn't keep changing and evolving, especially in an environment where, you know, you keep your phone or your watch for like a year, a year and a half? So I, I don't see any of these pieces being kind of optional. Hi. Um, another question. I was just wondering how you articulate your strategy in the multi-device environment, meaning going th like from your TV to your phone to your watch to your computer. And especially I was thinking about that, for example, for notification, because something that I personally witnessed is that you get a lot of notifications, and a lot of them are the same yes. from the same app. And obviously, like an app can tell, like it gives you like a plus one enough notification, never a minus one, because you already checked it somewhere else. Yes. <coughs> Where do you see this yes. is going? Yes. So that that's a really hard question. That's a great question. Um, the you, you have to think at the uh, at it from the other perspective, right? Like, what would happen if uh, you know you you did not receive a notification, right? And, and you'd probably be upset, especially you know, if it's an important one. Um, so uh, there's, there's this idea that you, know, you want to send, you want to be very deterministic with these notifications. So if you're going to send them to you know, your computer plus your phone plus your TV, you always send to all three. And yes, it's repetitive, but at least it's reassuring, right? Like, because it's like, I, I know that I'm not missing something. You're like, oh, I'm getting this again. I already got it. But you know you got it. Uh, if you think that, oh, do they know that I'm right now on my TV or are they going to send it, like you know, Skype does that a lot, right? Uh, do they know that I'm logged on my TV or are they going to try to call it on my phone and it's going to ring in three places or then it's going to ring on my phone but not on my TV? That is actually creating more confusion than the slight annoyance of having three notifications. I wish it were different, right? Like there, there are ways that you can go around that. You aggregate notifications, so instead of like sending you everything, we tell you you have five stuff to watch, and if you're like, yeah, I've already seen them, you don't need to go. Um, so you can do things like that to go around that. Uh, uh, personally, I think that it would be a per very personal say, actually, because when you say it's reassuring, to me, I fear that at one point, people get so frustrated with it that they will just shut off everything. Oh, I see. So, so uh, yes, and uh, the reality is, you know, that's a very, um, um, very kind of rational way to say, like, let's go and let people decide in settings. You'll get, like, 2% of your engineering users <laughs> doing it and, and nobody else. Yes, there's a lot of thinking around that. Um, 
there's, you know, notifications at Facebook is, is not just push. It's push plus email plus SMS plus that little jewel, the world map that shows up in your, in your service. So the one thing that's completely deterministic is you will always get everything in that jewel. And, and then we'll use various mechanisms to uh, inform you of select notifications. So you can opt to receive certain types of notifications via email, via SMS, via push. Um, so so that, that sort of channel decision can be customized. Uh, but the, the fact that we will always send you notifications about pretty much anything that happens around you on Facebook is, is sort of not optional. Like you always get that in your, in your jewel because we don't want you to be surprised. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is there any bucketing in terms of the critical notification versus not critical? Um, well, it depends what you think is critical, right? Like, um, <coughs> or what you qualify as critical. So I'll give you an example. Um, one notification that we introduced as a push <coughs> notification it doesn't look like it's critical, but in fact, like people love it. It's like letting you know of a friend's birthday. You will think like, why do I need to know about friend's birthday? But then if you have somebody who's picky, like say, you know, your significant other or your kids, you know, you tend to forget birthdays and Facebook reminds you that it's their birthday, you're like really, really grateful. Uh, and that's a way to, you know, reconnect with people you haven't connected with in a while. So um, that type of notification, you may think, oh, it's not a critical one. It was one of the most popular ones on Facebook. So, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm cautioning here is, is like you judging like this is important and this is not, as opposed to sort of being open and, and looking at, you know, what, what your users are looking for and, and testing if, if you have a doubt. Uh, hello. Um, I, uh, where, where are you? Hi. Um, so uh, I feel like this conversation, this book, might only be published in spring of 2016 because we're all very aware how quickly things are changing, especially those of us who's been in software for a long time. Um, and mo you can bet in three years things will be very different in the whole ecosystem. I see in your subtitle you mentioned the future of connected technology. I don't really think you addressed that in this talk. Perhaps we should buy the book. Um, but do you have any comments or something that might uh, On the future. address that? Yes, yes, I have. I, actually, I don't cover that in this talk, and you're right. I cover that extensively in my book. It's just you know, too much for just one talk. So the future of technology, I think you know, the, what, what I call mobile is mobile at large. So the Internet of Things and, and all these trends are, are, are part of you know, mobile, uh, connected cars, connected cities. Uh, when, when, I, when I think about, uh, about it, like, first of all, you know, a lot of what I talk about applies across the board because um, what, what mobile, mobile allows us to do is bring, you know, the, the man behind the technology, which is something that we've been, you know, especially in Silicon Valley, we've been a bit hiding behind the machine, right? Like it's convenient to hide behind the computer and be a little bit, you know, anonymous. So I think that what mobile allows us to do is bring our humanness back, and that's, you know, that's, you know, um, not going away, and that, that applies no matter, you know, the season or the time. Um, when, when I look at, at the future of these connected technologies, I look at who's going to be building them. And so millennial generation is, what's, you know, is, is where you know, things become important. Besides being digital native, i.e. they have you know, grown up with technology, there's like a lot of research that say like three characteristics. Right? They're very confident, very connected, <laughs> and very open to change. And if I you know, unpeel that, very confident, it's like they expect things to just work. And, to me, that's like very much related to the definition of beauty, right? Like things have to be very smooth, like wow, simple, efficient. Um, the, so that's the confidence part. Uh, connected, it's all about personalization. It's like makes things easy for me, right? I don't want to have to think about it. Privacy is sort of a, a non-issue. And then open to change is like if you've watched the, uh, the TV show Girls, right? There is constant <coughs> feedback uh, that's being given like in, in real time. Uh, that's also very much related to, to learning and growing. So I think that if you look at, you know, uh, connected cities, like the, the city of Montreal, for example, had a very, very interesting experiment at scale where they connected public transportation with shopping and with the environment on people's smartphone. They say, well, you know what, like, if you take public transportation, the minute you come out of the, the station, we'll recommend 
uh, very local offers for you. And the uptake on these offers was five to eight times bigger than just sort of random geolocal offers, right? So because they were connected to public transportation, people coming in for, this, for a specific purpose. And then they also said, well, if you take public transportation, every time you do that, instead of driving your car, you save one tree. And so we're going to gamify that. You're going to save a tree, right, every time in, in the game, like every time uh, you take public transportation. And all of a sudden, that created a community of people who cared about their city and stuff like that. And to me, that's really the, the essence of what the mobile lifestyle is. It's like at the, at the scale of a city. So I, I don't see that there's any difference in, in the rules that I present there. Uh, it's more like, uh, you know, kind of a, a technology um, specificity that says, oh, this is called mobile, this is called smartphone, this is called Internet of Things. To me, mobile is all about like mobile at large, like when, when we are humans and we evolve into a context that changes constantly. Does that answer your question? Okay, let's just take two more and then we can break and we always hang out here for a while. I think SC will stick around and answer. we'll give away some books, we'll answer some questions. You guys can check out User Voice. Let's do two more. I think we have one here. Cool. Hi, uh, so my name is Na. Uh, I think this is a very good um, framework that is both inspirational and informational on mobile product design. So sometimes I found myself surrounded with, you know, many uh, design guidelines, heuristics, you know, design principles. So just wondering, um, what are some of your thoughts or suggestions on applying this framework to, you know, design interfaces, products, and services? Thank yeah. You. Well, um, that's a great question, and and you know some some companies will will give you like very very detailed guidelines that you know uh, you, you can challenge or not depending on you know what you're trying to accomplish, but but using some of the principles that you know I, I talk about in the body rule, for example, the thumb rule, and the mom you know the thumb test and the mom test, they, they should be part of any uh, design guideline that people put together for mobile. Uh, when it comes to personalization. Um, I think that for, for, design, for designers in particular, when you look at the different filters, the people filters, the places filters, there's almost an inventory, right? And the different platforms like release new ones all the time, right? There's like an inventory of permission that you can go through. And as you design these use cases, you can go through them and say, which of these permissions, right? Or which of these access to personal information would help me like skip through that step? Right, so that's sort of a you know user experience or or even a, um, a, a design architecture uh, guidelines that you can you can use very effectively, and then uh, you know designing for growth um, uh, when it comes to learning with the you know focus on net promoter score I I think is um, you know is a very effective way to to do great design right like otherwise uh, what, what I see often when you when you design for growth is you have sort of a you know, the designer against the growth hacker. Right? And it's like, oh, I want to put the red button here. Like, oh, no, I don't want to hear about the red button. But if you, you know, work together and focus, like, what's going to make an impact on the user experience with the net promoter score, I think it's a very effective way to, um, you know, to kind of align your teams, even though you might have conflicting interests sometimes. I'm right here. Um, is there a certain strategy or um, framework that you particularly like that fits well with these principles that help us map our thinking? Like a lean canvas or, you know, one of these frameworks? That oh, yeah. Um, so when it comes to that, I mean, to be honest, like I'm, I'm not religious. Uh, and I will tell you, like, uh, there's no reason why, as a product manager, you would want to have a big religion around that. Uh, because everybody around you usually does have a religion and they're the ones that are doing the work and so you just want to be friends with them and make sure that you, you know, work in ways that will, you know, make them happy. Um, so I, I, you know, I, at, um, actually at every company that I've worked with, I used some version of Agile which sometimes looked a little bit like a waterfall uh, and, and it was fine. Um, I, I, you know, I, I um, Dan will probably not like me for saying that, but um, yeah, I think like it doesn't really uh, matter. These principles uh, apply regardless of the methodology, and I don't necessarily think that it's the role of a product manager to dictate the methodology that people use to do their work. Trying to stay true to those principles. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. In fact, you can help your engineers if you uh, get them to to look at what they are building with with their own humanness, right? Like, what do you think of that, right? And, and, and get behind the computer and for one second think things should be very simple. Things should feel very easy.
Yeah, I think there's very few companies doing Agile perfectly. Yeah. They have like capital A Agile and lowercase a Agile. So yeah, it's, it's all good. Uh, please join me in um, thanking SE for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right.